many law firm owners, they're not taught how to run a successful business. They're, they're taught to do the work and, and they don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs. In your book, Million Dollar Consulting, you just discuss the importance of having an entrepreneurial mindset. So what attributes or characteristics do you see in, in most successful entrepreneurs? Well, uh, in no special order, but to, to narrow it down to just a few, the first thing is you have to have a supreme, supremely high self-esteem, not over the top, but you have to differentiate between worth and efficacy. You know, efficacy is how well you do something. Now, you know, I can't play any musical instrument. I can barely play the radio. I'm not efficacious at music, but man, can I speak and can I write? And so things important to my career, I can do well. And if I fail to get something, if I fail to get a piece of business, I fail to get a book published, whatever it is, I simply say to myself, well, what have I learned and that I can use next time? I don't say I'm a lousy marketer. I don't say I'm a lousy writer. And so self-esteem is very, very important. The second thing is you have to have a remarkably strong sense of humor because humor keeps things in perspective. You know, if you look at the world today, missing an airplane or not getting a project is hardly earth shaking. You know, my father jumped out of airplanes over New Guinea in the Second World War with people shooting at him from 500 feet. Uh, he lived to be 100. Nobody's shooting at us. And so a sense of humor is really important for the perspective and for the relief of stress. And then the third thing is you really have to be bright. And I mean, uh, you have to be well-read and well-traveled. You have to know what's going on in different industries, in the world, in the markets. You have to have a strong vocabulary because vocabulary is the tools of our trade. Anybody who thinks that AI or chat GPT is going to take over is out of their minds. Now, I can see legal boilerplate. You know, I can see instructions for putting up a new TV, you know, and things like that. But the fact is that in 1982, uh, John Nesbitt talked in Megatrends, which is the first hit book of that type, about high tech, high touch. It's truer today than ever. And so as we look at AI and all this kind of stuff, we need high touch more than ever. And one of the things that I actually like about the legal profession is that if it's done well, it has to be high touch. You know, I'll, I'll mention this to you. In 1968, I was graduated from Rutgers University and, uh, you know, we were poor. I had no money. And I was offered a full scholarship to Rutgers Law, 45000 a year. 45000 a year today is equivalent to $407,000. And I turned it down at the last minute. <laughs> so I said, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think, you know, the, the education, the knowledge, the, the, the different professions. And, and I think one of the things you said in terms of this mindset and confidence, it's a bit different. And it's the first time I've heard it is it, it's it's you don't refer to it as scope creep. That's typically doing the work that the client wants you to do. That's that's out of scope, not in the contract. But what's the other form of scope? Because I think there's kind of a, a corollary here in terms of confidence and mindset. Well, there's scope seep. And that's a, a low esteem position where you want to keep doing things to justify your fee because you, you feel like an imposter. You don't feel your fee is right. And so consequently, you know, while you're there, you say, well, I know I'm working here on strategy, but, you know, there's some teamwork issues I'd be happy to include for you. And, you know, you, if you extrapolate that, you wind up washing the windows. So that low self-esteem issue causes us to offer more and more value without charging for it, which is preposterous. You know, you can't pay your mortgage. Uh, with uh, with free value you give people. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and that you have a whole series on your podcast, uh, The Uncomfortable Truth About Profit. And then that was one that really stuck out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's eliminating that waste. You know, w one of the things, too, that just continuing to stay on this topic, you know, a lot of individuals st struggle with public speaking, anxiety, and even attorneys presenting in court, right? As as a litigator, you know, as an inductee of the Professional Speaking Hall of Fame, what have you found some techniques to that you've used to improve your speaking ability to overcome any types of anxiety or fear on the stage? Like, what are, what are some of the things just to, to become a better speaker? Well, you know, this is a really good topic you bring up because there's this crap that says, you know, people fear public speaking more than they fear death, right? So on the Seinfeld show, he's doing a eulogy and he says, if that's true, the guy in the coffin has less to worry about than I do. You know, and so <laughs> it's that ridiculous. Uh, the issue here is that uh, we use these um, these bromides. We, we use these things to try to give us permission 
not to get better at something. So if people say to me, I have writer's block. I say, well, write a sentence. And they write a sentence. I say, there, I've healed you. You know, you're healed. Uh, and with public speaking, you have to have a single conversation with an individual. Now, there's an audience out there, whether it's real in an auditorium or it's Zoom, you know, it's, it's remote. You just have to have a conversation. And what you need to do is keep in mind, you are not there to be judged. I've never looked at a smile sheet in my life. You are there to help people. And if you're there to help people, you'll put your entire entity, your entire persona into it, because helping is a noble cause. And, you know, I just, I came from church this morning, and it's Lent, right? So my wife and I go to church in the morning. And both the, the I'm a lector in church. It was a lector this morning, read a long passage in a monotone. And so you can't really appreciate the power of the passage. And then the priest gave a sermon in a monotone uh, and, and speaking very low. And, and my point is that you shouldn't try to bring stardom onto yourself, but unless you use inflection and intonation and energy, you can't help anyone. In fact, you hurt them because they doze off. So uh, it's unfortunate that in, in seminaries and in law school and in medical school and so forth, they don't teach people how to communicate well. And that's nor to MBA students, London. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's common. Even I, I have a history education degree, and I had like one class on speaking, and I only had to give three speeches for the entire class. I, I just it was it's truly unreal. And I, I I think there's this, you know, I I can't remember exactly how it goes, but the inflection of different words, the emphasis of different words, can mean something entirely different, and and just you know it, comprehending that differently. Well, if I say to you, I want you as a friend, or I want you as a friend, I mean, it makes a world of difference. Right.